Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave, and it is that time of year uh, when I pull out the big book and make a list of the things that I am thankful for this year. This is my favorite things, and I, I'm going to range a little farther and wider than I have in years past, uh, and I'm going to start with some local food because I really want to give a shout out to my neighborhood here in San Francisco, the Mission District. Uh, it is a paradise for lovers of food of every stripe. I'm very, we are very lucky to be situated here. Uh, and the two, I want to cover two restaurants, an old and a new. The new one is Yellow Moto Pizza on the corner of 18th Street and Valencia. Uh, this was formerly Flour and Waters Pizzeria, but David White, one of the founders, has split off from the group, and Yellow Moto Pizza is apparently his singular venture. And having had the pizza before and after, I can tell you the pies haven't changed much, but the quality has gotten better. The pizzas are, whew. look, the mission already had a nice compliment of incredible pizzas. We have some deep dish, we got some thin crust, we got all sorts of pizzas represented here. And so to me, for Yellow Moto to put its flag in the ground and say, here's our version, that's a bold move. And I, I've been eating there once a week for the past few months and it is so freaking good. It is just phenomenal. Get their burrata pizza and whatever seasonal arancini, one of my all time favorite dishes, is going to be worth your while. The old restaurant I wanted to cover are my friends at Foreign Cinema. Gail and John have had Foreign Cinema now coming on 25 years, I believe. Um, I have been eating there that entire time. <sighs> It is one of the great San Francisco restaurants, in my opinion, uh, not just for the food, but also for the atmosphere and also the people that have worked there. Um, many of them have been there on the order of a decade or more. Uh, it really shows in the quality of everything that happens over at Foreign Cinema. I eat there for brunch monthly, dinner monthly. It's where I take out of town visitors for a classic San Francisco high-end restaurant experience. Uh, it is a true giant in San Francisco restaurants, and I'm so glad that it is still around. The uh, uh, That is old and new. Right. Oh, so I happen in this neighborhood to live near one of the world's great grocery stores known as Buy Right. They have two different locations in San Francisco, but they're not who I'm talking about right now. Buy Right is a high-end grocery store, which means you're buying phenomenal ingredients and you are paying a premium for them. That that's a, a total truth. The fact is, is that for some things you don't need to head over to Buy Right because there is another grocery store here in the Mission that doesn't get a lot of love except from locals, and it is called Duck Loy, D-U-C-L-O-I, um, referred to informally here in the Mission as just the duck. They have one of the great sauce aisles of any grocery store I've ever been to. I love the staff. I like their sandwiches. Their bread and chip and cookie assortment is par excellence, but their sauce aisle is really whatever sauce you need, whether it's a certain esoteric Korean, Korean sauce or a ponzu or a, 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 a tobiko or a kupi mayonnaise, they're going to have it in their aisles. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that it's a reg we shop there almost daily. Bless the duck. Uh, okay, that is local eating. I am going to move on now to some uh, media, movies, television, podcasts, and books. Um, in movies, I am late to the horror film Midsommar, but I have made up for lost time with how much I love this freaking movie. Uh, my partner, Mrs. Don't Try This, and I watched it just about a month and a half ago. And then in the ensuing two weeks, we watched it twice more. Okay, she watched it all three times. I've watched two and a half times. But this is a movie that gets better on repeated viewings because it rewards careful and close attention. It has a pace that is very slow, but not the creeping dread slowness of a certain kind of horror movie I can't take. It also all takes place in broad daylight. And I, I'm, I'm holding back the best for last because, and it's Florence Pugh. The whole cast is terrific. The entire cast does a really, really great job in this film. But Florence Pugh is a, a complete revelation as the main character of Midsommar and her transformation is astounding. Um, 
I don't love horror as a genre. I don't like being scared and I don't like the creeping dread of a movie like Hereditary. I find that's just not a space I want to spend time in, even though I can recognize that it is an objectively terrific film. It's just not my taste. Midsommar totally is. And if you're afraid of the gore, it does happen in broad daylight, I feel like the film protects you enough that you could kind of get away with doing this and not having to see too much that you don't want to see. I can't recommend Midsommar enough. It really surprised me how much I enjoyed it. Um, TV series, I was blown away this year by Gaslit. Uh, this is a, 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 a fictionalized, well, it's a dramatized account of John and Martha Mitchell. John Mitchell was one of the architects of the Watergate break-in. Uh, and he famously had a wife who spoke her mind. John Mitchell has played by Sean Penn in an astounding role where he is covered in makeup and yet manages to make this unappealing looking man have a tremendous amount of charisma that only Sean Penn could bring to a character like that. And Julia Roberts is astounding. Again, this is another show in which the cast is astounding. Betty Gilpin uh, plays Mo Dean, John Dean's uh, wife. I'm a huge Betty Gilpin fan. Uh, I'm a Betty Gilpin stan. Watch The Hunt. I just watched it again last night because we were watching Gaslit and we we're like, let's see some more Betty Gilpin. Um, but Gaslit is, I think, eight episodes. It might be more than that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Anyway, Gaslit is a, it's a television series, limited series. It comes from the podcast, the first season of the podcast, Slow Burn, and it's terrific all the way through. And if you're at all political junkie of political history, it's, it's fantastic. Um, books, I would be remiss as a science communicator if I did not sing the praises of Carlo Rovelli, uh, specifically two books of his that blew my freaking mind wide open. One was Seven Brief Lessons in Physics, which is, look, I'll be honest, I love A Brief History of Time, but I think of that as a difficult book to read. It is, it is, it goes deep and asks a lot from the listener. Uh, it gets quite technical. And I guess, like I said, I read it in my teens and I loved it, or I read it in my 20s and I loved it. But Rovelli writes the kind of popular science I feel is a direct inheritor of Carl Sagan's writing. Um, the Order of Time and Seven Brief Lessons of Physics are these two books of Rovelli's I read this year that completely shifted my understanding of absolutely everything. And when you add on top of all of that great science communication that he does, that English is not his first language, and he is able to rhetorically come up with phrases like the fundamental grammar of the universe, I'm like annoyed that this man who's for whom English is your second language is such an incredible writer. Um, I have bought more of his books. I'm going to read more of his books. I'm sure you'll hear about more of them from me. Um, I've been traveling a lot lately, which means time spent on planes. And one of my primary occupations on a plane is to listen to podcasts. And I've listened now in the last two months to about 30, 40, 10, 20, 30, 40. 30. Yeah, almost 50 hours, I think, of Karina Longworth's podcast, You Must Remember This. I may have mentioned this podcast in the past. Uh, I am a film history buff. I'm a film buff. I love reading about film. I love reading about how films are made. I love reading about the difficult conditions under which they came to be. Uh, Karina Longworth has devoted hundreds of hours of her podcast over the past 10 some odd years on the lost and often forgotten history of cinema's first century. That is the tagline she gives it. And it is a beautiful tagline because she's able to look at these subjects, whether it's the Hollywood blacklist or uh, dead blondes or sex in movies in the 80s, and she's able to take a look at them from the cultural remove we have right now. But she's not judgmental about these old movies. She recognizes when things don't work and talks about that. But I'm, frankly, one of my favorite things about Longworth as a historian and a critic, and I think she functions as both in this podcast, is how much she's always giving you her, her, her reactions on multiple planes. She gives you a reaction as, uh, a, uh, uh, as a critic, as a fanatic, as a 
just a person as a woman. Uh, when she talks about how attractive John Garfield was back in the 40s and the 50s, I have this on my list now to go watch some John Garfield movies because I'm always surprised at what watching these old films can unpack for us about our culture. Uh, and that is really one of, I guess, the primary subjects of You Must Remember This. Uh, I love her mannerist way of reading. She's very precise in her articulation. And at first, I will admit, I found it not off-putting, but I found it surprising. And I now find that when I hear her particularly precise grammatical iterations, I find it like one of my happy safe spaces to go. Um, these are the four, four series that I've listened to much most recently. 15 episodes on the Hollywood Blacklist, which is incredible. Uh, 10 episodes on the erotic 80s, on sex and movies in the 80s. 10 episodes on Polly Platt, Peter Bogdanovich's first wife, and the most important contributor to the latter, to latter 20th century film that you don't know about. Uh, and Sammy and Dino, uh, multiple part series on Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin and their combined and disparate histories and what their different experiences of their success tells us about culture and uh, and and films in general. Yeah, you must remember this. Oh, uh, yeah, she loves movies and yet unafraid to pull back the sugary coating and look at the dirty underbelly of how they got made. Uh, okay. We are close. Oh, right. Okay. So, uh, 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 color revealing. Da, da, da. You must remember this. Da, da, da. Yeah. Okay. Tools. I have three tools to cover. Um, one is really surprising, super inexpensive tool, but I was watching one of my favorite things from last year, Stefan Gotzevinter's channel, chant, chantel, <laughs> Stefan Gotzevinter's channel on YouTube. And he was trying to line up uh, one of the things you frequently have to do on a milling machine is line up the center of your spindle with a hole that you've got uh, of something clamped in your vise or on a rotary table. And aligning the spindle with a hole, there are many different modalities. Uh, they all have their pluses and minuses. But he pointed out that he can get within a very, very tight tolerance without using any measuring equipment just by eye, but specifically augmenting the human eye with a jeweler's loop. Um, L-O-U-P-E is what I'm saying here. And with a 20X loop, I have found this to be <laughs> the most surprisingly useful milling machine tool that I have yet encountered. Uh, you use this and you bring it right up close to two points meeting. Now here's some B-roll of that. And you, I literally have used this and then unset my center and use measuring equipment to get there and I was within 1,000th on both the X and the Y axis using just this jeweler's loop. We'll include a link in the description. Earlier this year, uh, my friend, wonderful maker, designer, rock star, Jack White, did me an incredible solid here in the cave and recovered one of my shop stools. And I love this thing. We did a whole video about it. Uh, but also when he sent the stool, he also sent a... Uh, a hand-modified tape measure. This is his favorite kind of tape measure. He included a little ray skin, which is an orange, because it's my favorite color. He had a 45, 45 RPM record adapter glued here, but because I keep dropping this, it's fallen off and it's over there waiting to be glued back on. But, so, in addition to having a cool tape measure that Jack put together with three stripes here for Third Man Records, I also discovered that there was a tape measure I didn't know about that blew my mind. This is a Crescent Lufkin Black Widow tape measure. Glow in the dark numbers, easy to read, really robust. It even has some gription stuff out here on the lip that you use for catching things. You can catch both ways from top or bottom. This is a, a monster of a tape measure. And I mean monster in the most positive way effusive terms that I could conjure up. Um, and I appreciate Jack for letting me know that such great tools exist. Um, I use DeWalt tools here in the shop. You may use Milwaukee or you may use Makita, but one thing that unifies all of us who ha have invested in a certain system of cordless tools 
is that once you've bought the batteries, you're kind of committed down a path to buying tools to go with those batteries. I'm DeWalt, which means that every now and then I go looking for what new tools DeWalt has released for their battery system. And I recently came upon this, their die grinder. Now, die grinder is a tool specifically for, uh, for fixing steel welds, but it is a super, super, super versatile shop tool. This goes up to 25,000 RPM, and it is a handheld cordless tool. I've already used it like every third day since I got this about a month ago, and I love this thing. Hold on, let me put a battery in it. So it has three settings. This is the 10,000 setting. This is the uh, 17,005. And here's the 25,000. Now, both the starting and the stopping on that front, that is really great. Plus, there's a nicely balanced set of bearings in there. Uh, like I said, this has already become one of the staples of my shop. It sits with the angle grinders and the other grinding tools. Uh, the DeWalt die grinder, I could not be more happy with the addition of this to my cave. Uh, oh, I forgot one book. I've totally forgot one book. Um, I We did a video on this on the channel, but I would be remiss if I did not say that one of my favorite things is this incredible, it's part biography, it's part coffee table book, but it, what it really is, is a, a, a biographical dive into the incredible fertile mind of the, <laughs> one of God's own prototypes, Phil Tippett. Uh, an insanely brilliant designer and animator and maker uh, and student of animal motion. Phil Tippett has so much more to do with 20th century film than you may realize. Oh, the King robot, one of the great robots ever designed. Um, this is precisely the kind of book that a personality like Phil should get in their lifetime. Uh, and I'm delighted he is, I know that he is very happy with this book. It's a masterpiece. And if you, if special effects in movies mean anything to you, this should be part of your library. All right, I think I am almost done. Just wanna double check my list here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, um, lastly. Uh, the overarching giant thing that is my favorite thing this year is this channel. It's Tested. Uh, I have been running Tested with portions of this team now for 10 years, and I have had for the longest part of that time a business partner uh, in that endeavor. And very recently, I was able to buy out my business partner so that Tested is now all under our team's control. And I didn't know what tested could really be until COVID hit. And I feel like COVID was the crucible under which all of us that, that make tested uh, started to see the wider landscape of the kinds of stories that we could tell on this channel. And it is an unbelievable fantasy to get to come in here for 30 plus hours a week and build, but it is an honor to get to tell these stories with the team that makes up Tested. Uh, Kristen Lomazny, our general manager. Ryan Kaiser, our production manager. Joey Famelli, our shooter, editor, and amazing filmmaker. Norm Chan, lead editor, also editor and shooter. Uh, Josh Self, our newest addition to our team. Uh, and another new addition to our team, Sandra Kimberly, our CFO. Uh, I have been working with some of these people for over 30 years. Uh, <laughs> even, even Joey and Norm now for 10 years. And the individual enthusiasm and point of view that every member of this team brings to this channel is such a key to its success. And like I said, it is my honor to get to come here every day and work with these folks. 
Um, and they are absolutely, without a doubt, my favorite thing this year. Thank you guys for joining me for this. Uh, I really love this practice every year of spending some time in gratitude for the things that increased, increased, what I wanted to say something like enjoyment, but it was, it's not quite that. It's like the things that I put on this list are things that expanded my understanding of what's possible. And, uh, it's a great list, but nothing in that list has expanded my idea of what's possible more than the team I get to work with every day. Take good care of each other. Have an excellent holiday, and I will see you guys next time. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support us even further, you can by becoming a tested member. Uh, details are, of course, below, but it includes all sorts of perks and we're building them all the time. You get advanced word and behind the scenes photos of some of our projects questions, you get to ask direct questions during my live streams, and we have some members-only videos, including the Adam real-time series of unbroken, unedited shots of me working here in the shop. They are weirdly meditative. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you on the next one.